Um, worldwide and in Chile, there is a reckoning around um, sexual harassment in higher ed. The issue is under-researched, under-conceptualized, and unsurprisingly under-reported. Starting last year, in 2017, only seven out of 60 universities had any published protocols dealing with sexual harassment, and um, many in those seven didn't even have a definition of sexual harassment, and only encompassed very specific behaviors relating student-on-student -student harassment. Um, the legal landscape was also lacking. Um, sexual harassment is only codified into law as it regards to violence against minors and as labor harassment in the workplace, which is usually defined as, and in Chilean law, as um, sexual favor, quid pro quo, that a boss would request from an employee. So um, this legal and um, policy landscape was countered in uh, Mayo Feminista, which is Feminist May, and these um, protests that erupted in May of this past year. Um, they began as in crescendo denouncements against very, very high profile academics, uh, notably at the Universidad Austral and uh, the Universidad de Chile. Um, these protests were across the entire city, from the south to the north, and in Santiago. Um, between May and June, almost all universities had some sort of feminist strike, and over 30 departments were in Toma, which means <coughs> they weren't having classes. They actually took over the universities, and no one was even coming into classes. And so, at some universities, these, these Tomas even lasted for two months. The two demands of, the two kind of overarching demands of the feminists were non-sexist education, which is a much more kind of um, utopian demand towards eradicating uh, gendered language, towards including gender studies at universities, uh, gender studies departments, um, totally reforming higher ed as well as um, high school education, and um, the second demand is centered around the absence and insufficiency of sexual harassment protocols in universities, which is what my project focuses on. Um, it has been mentioned before that Chile has a long history of student manifestations, and these movements over the summer really kind of put new wind into the sails of the movement and um, were, were similarly as large and kind <coughs> of radical in their demands, but saw many um, discreet, discreet successes one by student activists, namely in Universidad Austral, the, the university agreed to most of the students' demands and now is in the process of developing a huge anti-discrimination organization. Uh, President Sebastián Piñera, who is of a conservative party, agreed to a federal working group to explore possibilities for stronger federal legislation. Um, Gerardo Varela, the Minister of Education for Pineda's cabinet, was actually removed after he called the feminist grievances small humiliations. Um, in June of 2018, the law of public universities went to, went to effect with, which prohibited sexual harassment and finally covered um, not just student-on-student -student harassment, but also harassment as it related to professors towards students. Um, because the previous law that I recently, that I just talked about from 2005, that only really encompasses labor harassment would only cover um, employees at private universities. So we're talking about many, many people in higher ed who are simply not covered by any protections. Um, and now there are over, I think, 20 universities who are in the process of developing protocols as it relates to sexual harassment, strengthening their current sexual harassment protocols, and even revisiting um, sexual harassment cases that were dealt with poorly in the past. Mm -hmm. So it, their, their successes are quite remarkable. When they were in Toma, many um, feminist activists would only actually let in administrators so they could negotiate the, the terms of agreement to stopping the Tomas. And above all, what I think is the greatest success is that uh, feminist activists have entirely changed the, the conversation about sexual harassment in Chile. They have introduced the term of sexual harassment into the vernacular of the country. So my um, 
my main motivation in, in the study is there is no literature or understanding of the current conceptualization of sexual harassment that students or administrators have. The protocols that have been developed are largely um, non-uniform. There isn't really a kind of coherent definition of sexual harassment that, that all the universities are dealing with. Um, many don't mention consent. Um, interestingly enough, the rape laws in Chile don't mention consent. Um, consent is not codified into any of the laws. So there's really this opportunity to create policy from the ground up. And one of the main kind of grievances of the feminists was that in the past, sexual harassment protocols were developed from the top down, and they were largely defined by liberal harassment, which is a very strict definition that is unilateral and unwelcome sexual advances or requests of sexual favors, and that usually results in loss of job opportunities. So it's a really neoliberal model in how it defines sexual harassment on labor productivity. And what my project will focus on is I will begin with semi structured interviews with activists. And um, I really buy into the generative, generative uh, research model, which, which thinks that the stakeholders are um, the people that you're studying, and they should have a say in the design of your research. And I kind of have my own um, hypothesis going into this. I am particularly interested from a theoretical standpoint on how the the dialogue between anti-marketization politics of the student activists has combined, combined with um, anti-violence feminism. And a lot of gender scholars in the UK and, the, in, and in the US have started saying, wouldn't it be interesting, wouldn't there be so many opportunities for, for common cause activism if anti-marketization politics could enter into dialogue with Title IX activism and anti-sexual harassment activism in, in the US. So Chile has kind of proved an unlikely case study for how this dialogic re relationship could evolve. And I'll be really interested in seeing if in my focus groups with students, there is um, a different understanding of consent as occurring between two similarly, um, similarly situated individuals in the social structure, or if there's more of an understanding of how hierarchies can affect um, perceptions and how an institution might seek to protect its reputation for its value on the marketplace and how they might attempt to protect offenders <coughs> due to also the, their value in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, this movement is extremely recent. There haven't been any um, substantive efforts to document the strategies used by the activists. There have been a lot of incredible um, essays that Chilean academics have published already that kind of trace the origins of the movement from the from the student movements and talk about it in the broader schema of Ni Una Menos activism, which is a broad anti-violence movement that has um, recorrido, that has gone across throughout all of Latin America. But I'm particularly interested in um, documenting the specific strategies employed by activists in Chilean universities. Um, and for, for protocols to be really effective, what the literature tells us and what um, from research on the particular experiences of victims in, in the US, in the UK, in different universities in Africa, it's clear that the best protocols are um, institution-wide and focus on prevention and not just reaction. So, so in going along with this idea of how important preventative um, approaches can be, of the sexual harassment protocols I've read, only two mention uh, the importance of creating preventative policies around sexual harassment, but none actually outline what that would look like. And I, an undergrad, um, launched this model around anonymous storytelling to shed light on, on stories around, unspoken narratives around race, um, class issues, poverty, mental health, body image issues, and sexual assault. And I would like to employ the same model um, at the university I'll be at, which is Universidad de Portales, and I've talked to feminists, student activists, and they were very interested in the model and in trying to see how we could reach a wider audience. And uh, it doesn't frame the dialogue in terms of good, bad, um, consent, non-consent 
offender um, victim, but instead kind of engages in these really complex conversations with the end goal of shedding light on on experiences that are not the 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 normal privileged person, which kind of challenges how we think about uh, consent and sexual harassment in a more neoliberal structure. Oh, and another um, really great thing about the focus group model is that it not only would allow me to hopefully eventually publish my research and gather, gather a lot of rich data around how sexual harassment is conceptualized and understood by students, but also would form the basis for strong educational campaigns around uh, what education needs to be done, what awareness students have of their rights, and the current processes that exist in their university. And I have uh, experience with the, the focus group model with fictional vignettes, which will be the same model I'm employing to talk to students uh, in El Salvador, where I spent um, I've been doing research for the last two years, well I've been in school but on breaks going to El Salvador to do research there around gray areas of opinions on abortion, so using fictional vignettes to explore how people think and talk about abortion when it relates to really difficult areas of um, rape and extreme health issues and poverty. Um, I have experience drafting um, policies at my own university regarding Title IX and also the Academic Code of Honor. And uh, for the last six months, I've been working at the National Immigrant Justice Center on asylum cases that are mostly um, gender-based claims. So it's women who are escaping horrible, horrible situations of past persecution by their, their, their abusive partners. Um, most of them are from Central America, so you might have seen something in the news about asylum seekers. <laughs> so that's what I've been working on. Um, and then after the Fulbright, I would like to get a JD um, to do gender law and hopefully also continue doing research in sociology. Are you centered only on feminist um, victims? Mm. What do you mean by that? Focusing because the focus group. Right. Oh, of course. Oh, of course, yeah, and that's why I um, opt to use the term gender-based violence instead of violence against women mm -hmm. and understanding how gender can operate and even silence uh, male victims as well because of what the kind of really public stereotype is, is a vic of a victim. It's you know, usually a helpless woman and trying, I've actually, in with Show Some Skin, we had a couple um, monologues that were about experiences of male students who had been sexually assaulted. So, yeah, I'm always looking to challenge those stereotypes. I was hoping you could uh, define a term. I wasn't sure what neoliberalism oh, yeah. means. That's a great question. So I think defining it is a challenge, but a neoliberal model is usually a model that um, anatomizes the individual, kind of overshadows structures of privilege and oppression, and it really um, defines a person's value in relation to the marketplace. Um, so is that <clears throat> what you meant by anti-marketization activists, like when you're talking about the possible blood there, like common cause activism? Exactly, yeah. So. When I talk about anti-marketization, um, a big rallying cry for the, the students in 2011 was Educación Gratuita, um, which meant y de calidad, so free and quality education. That is not the demand of the feminists, is not free education, but they talk about quality education in a really similar way that um, is, is preconditioned on access, and for there to be access, it has to be affordable. And one other question is, <coughs> Obviously, as everyone knows, like Fulbright projects are subject to so much change before you even mm -hmm. get here because you're exactly. doing something you proposed like two years ago exactly. almost. And so I'm wondering like what it was like for you and how you were changing or what your project was like before because like that was happening, you know, last exactly. year when I was here. And so exactly. So um, my pr my uh, research proposal was kind of purposely a bit vague and it centered around feminist mobilization because that's been something that we've seen ac across the continent. And I was especially interested in Chile because of the 
the really um, noticeable shift, not just in the context of Chile coming from um, not having passed substantive uh, feminist legislation since like before the dictatorship, but also of, of Chile in the context of Latin America and all of the policy proposals that were being introduced in the context of the Ni Una Menos movement. So I was particularly interested in anti-violence feminist activism um, that's centered around really horrific cases of femicide. But as the mobilizations were happening in the summer and as, you know, Pineda won that, that changed the landscape for, for gender activism and for gender politics, I it just seemed like the perfect opportunity to, to study this activism. And um, I mean, they have a huge momentum. They have a lot of momentum for, for crafting and demanding better policies. So as someone who seeks to be a scholar advocate, it seemed like a good place to insert myself. And I let my institutional affiliations know about the kind of refocus of the project. And they were excited about that and supportive of that. Um, I was curious about the particular groups that you're that you plan to work mm -hmm. with, um, and the I mean, we mentioned the focus groups. So yeah. where, at which uh, I don't know if they're going to be students at university campuses or activists yes. themselves. In which groups? Yeah. So I uh, plan to do semi-structured interviews with activists for this month, just kind of to document strategies and to really deepen my understanding of the movement. I'm an outsider. I wasn't here for the marches. I never participated in the marches. So that's kind of the, the impetus between behind the um, semi-structured interviews with activists. And the group I'm working with is Red Chilena um, de, de, Contra la Violencia Hacia las Mujeres. Mm -hmm. So they're a big NGO that's like an umbrella NGO for 300 smaller feminist NGOs. And they're going to help connect me to feminist activists. But the focus groups will hopefully be representative of all different kinds, types of universities. I really hope to sample from um, religiously affiliated universities, public universities, universities of different prestige, students who study different things. Um, I'll be doing male and female focus group interviews. Um, it would be great to, to do focus groups with administrators as well, but because of the time constraints, I want to be realistic, and I think that getting around 15 to 20 focus group of students would, would be achievable. achievable. Um, Sorry, one more question. No, are perfect. you going to be like geographically focused in a particular area, or are you supposed to figure right. out? Right. So I'll be or? based in Santiago, um, but if I have the opportunity to travel to, especially Universidad Austral, and do some interviews there and meet some activists there, that would be that would be excellent. But I'll be based in Santiago. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Um, so <clears throat> this kind of reminds me a little bit about kind of the, the whole change behavior aspect that kind of came up in the last presentation. And, um, and there was sort of this sort of um, penalties mm -hmm. or kind of retribution for acts versus this sort of mm -hmm. preemptive. And I'm curious if you have um, questions in your interviews or for your focus groups that are um, aimed at getting at how the activists are thinking about being proactive and maybe like talking about sex ed in schools and getting mm -hmm. consent to be a conversation that they're having. I know that would be there would be a lot of pushback given the private um, impact and, and a lot of religious um, integration in the schools that would might push back on some of that. But mm -hmm. I was just curious if you had kind of aimed some of your right. So so what the literature does show is that um, severe sanctions are not always the best way to decrease the numbers of sexual harassment incidents and sexual assault incidents, but what can be extremely effective is visibilization of experiences around sexual harassment and um, educational campaigns. Um, there is some really interesting literature out there on kind of this idea of legal consciousness and if something happens to you but you don't have a word for it or a name for it, do you know what happened to you? And what the research on, and this is a lot has been done in the states, on um, having clear, understandable definitions around sexual harassment can um, be much better for reporting because people are kind of occupying tools for the same kit and um, share in a common understanding of what sexual harassment is. So I'll be really interested in seeing how different students um, delineate what is considered 
inappropriate inappropriate behavior because that can be extremely context dependent. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you again.